George Floyd. Um, while accountability was taken this week, we still have a long road ahead of us for our BIPOC communities. And I just thought that we'd take a few moments um, in silence. Thank you all. Thanks so much for being here. Um, you know, those of you that have been to this program before know that um, it wouldn't be possible without our Powerful Voices partner, Bank of America. Um, it was their vision that really took this, this to the next level. And really, I don't know, since they came on board, it's gotten deeper and more meaningful every single time. We always talk about that. Um, so here to talk on their behalf is Janice Neo, Senior Relationship Manager in their global commercial banking team. So I'll move it over to you, Janice. Thank you very much, Kristen. Um, hi, everyone. I'm sorry. I don't know if my camera is turned on. I've been trying to mess with it for a little bit while the um, while well, everyone was talking, but for some reason it's not turning on for me today. Um, but I shall not hold everyone up. Uh, I'm very, very happy to be with uh, all of you here today on behalf of Bank of America and all of our associates across Colorado. Uh, we are very, very proud to be the presenting sponsor of the Chamber's Powerful Voices series. And um, I sincerely believe that part of what makes the Powerful Voice the series so successful, as Kristen and um, the rest of you have shared, is that apart from your presence, um, it is our willingness to share lessons learned with one another. And, um, you know, I don't wanna take up too much time, but in my role, I have the privilege of working with many business owners, leadership teams, vendors. And um, I just wanna quickly share two things that I've learned to start. Um, the first one is um, to be kind to ourselves and to others. Uh, I know it's very cliche and you probably heard it over a hundred times by now, uh, but I think we can all agree that we have a lot going on this last one year, you know, working from home, homeschooling, you're on mute, please mute yourself, barking dogs, everything, right? So um, at this point, I really, I'm kind of okay with not looking perfect. And even if my camera's not working right now, which um, just so everybody know, I put on makeup just so I can be present for all of you here today. Um, so I'm okay with not looking perfect or sounding perfect. Um, and, uh, and people are just enjoying the virtual engagement and seeing a smile on video is so much better than reading another email. And to quote Brenda Bouchard, one of my favorite motivational gurus, uh, taking care of yourself as you're striving isn't a luxury. It is a necessity for long-term performance. Um, and second, and the last point is pivoting. Very cliche as well, and probably the second most overused word, first being unprecedented, but one that still rings true um, today. As I was engaged to assist with the bank's PPP forgiveness efforts, I got to hear firsthand stories of clients, all who are still thriving, even when operating at a lower or smaller capacity. So these stories of courage and perseverance empowers me. And I hope that by sharing them with you, um, it will empower you as well. So um, I'm very excited to hear from Veronica, and I hope that you will continue to engage the chamber and with each other throughout the year and beyond. And thank you very much, the entire Colorado Women's Chamber team for all of your efforts to elevate powerful voices right here in our own community. Enjoy today's speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Janice. I, you were perfect. Like that was amazing. So even though you weren't striving, that was beautiful. Thank you. Um, this, this series wouldn't be possible without your support. So we're going to now go into some breakout groups, but I, you know, one of the things about this series is that it shows us a really incredible female leader who's willing to share their vulnerability on their path of where they're going. And those of you that know me in this community know that um, my mom passed away on Tuesday morning. And in the days following the words of support and through the grueling process of her passing, 
I began to think so much about this community. And it was this community that took me through this incredibly difficult time. And I think so often as women, um, we're getting better at it, but our opportunities for vulnerability in the workplace and to provide support to one another is truly changing work cultures. Um, and when I think about this community, I really wanna resonate on the fact that it's a community of warriors. And I thought so much about that in these past days, not just warriors for themselves, but warriors for one another. And we all need warriors in our lives. And these women and men, their vulnerability, even in the workplace, it's, it's changing things. And building deep and meaningful relationships with one another and fighting for one another to you know, attain our hopes and dreams and carrying the burden when it's tough, that's how we're gonna get to where we wanna go. I wouldn't be here without my warriors around me right now. And, and when I think about Veronica, she's such a soul sister to me, especially through this process. I can't wait to hear her story. Um, so as we go into breakouts, I want you to remember that, that when you build those deep and meaningful relationships with one another and you become warriors for one another, that's how your hopes and dreams come true in the workplace and in life. And that's what this community is about. So I want to encourage you when you go into breakouts today to be vulnerable with one another. And I, I don't want to choose one topic, but what I will tell you when we go into breakouts is that I want you to share your hopes and dreams share what you're struggling with on that path and you will find a community of support that will help you get there. I 150% guarantee it. So we're going to go into breakouts now. Just remember that as you're starting to share your struggles, hopes, and dreams, and we'll be back CEO of the Denver Public Schools Foundation. Um, and they are the strategic fundraising partner for DPS as a bilingual multicultural leader with a broad experience in education, entertainment, retail, and healthcare within the international for-profit and nonprofit sectors. She leads the DPS Foundation by overseeing strategy operations and fundraising. She joined the DPS Foundation from DPS's Family and Community Engagement Office, where she served as the Chief Officer and led efforts to broaden parent and community engagement processes and strategies. Prior to that, Veronica served as a program officer at the Piton Foundation, where she worked with the foundation's grantees, as well as other foundations, grassroots organizations, and community stakeholders to help advance key initiatives supporting student achievement and adult self-sufficiency. She brings to all her roles deep experience in strategic communications and management honed from providing counsel to a variety of employers and clients, including Turner Network Television, Latin America, Comcast Cable Latino, Susan G. Komen for The Cure, the City of Denver and Metropolitan State University of Denver. She's a member of the Women's Forum of Colorado, a chapter of the International Women's Forum. And she's also one of the top 25 most powerful women of the Colorado Women's Chamber. She's originally from Venezuela, where she graduated from Universidad Metropol uh, Metropolitana in Caracas and obtained her master's degree in business administration from Kennesaw State University in Georgia. She's driven by an unwavering commitment to make her adopted home better and hope help those who are most vulnerable. To this end, Veronica was selected by the Aspen Institute for its inaugural class of Colorado Children and Families Health and Human Services Fellows. Um, and most recently, she was honored by being selected as a 2019 Woman of Distinction by the Girl Scouts of Colorado. Um, I love reading bios, but I also like to talk about um, what these people mean to me and mean to our community. And Veronica has been a never ending, unwavering source of support for me. Um, her style, her directness, um, who she is as a person makes me a better person every single day. And we're so lucky to have with us today, Veronica Fagoli Fleischer. So hands in the air. Yay, Vero, thanks so much for being here. I encourage you all to kind of put your speaker view on because I think it helps the experience a little bit better. We're gonna be back in person soon. Um, we're gonna probably have to do some hybrid version of this so we can still get everybody in place. But um, welcome, Vero. Thanks Thank for you. Here. Thank you for having me here. Of course, of course. 
So let's start with, you know, one of the one of the things we talked about in your bio. And I know just in recent years, you have such incredible stories of growing up in Venezuela and sort of what was, you know, going on with current events. Can you talk to us a little bit about growing up in Venezuela and your thoughts on the country now? Well, uh, first, thank you very much, Kristen, for having me here. What a what an amazing opportunity to actually create community, which one of the things that I, I love about. We should do this with food because it's the other thing that I love the most, cook and bringing people together. Um, you, um, I see people on the call, even a, my dear friend Astrid Say has joined you from all over Atlanta, Georgia. <laughs> uh, this is fantastic. Thank you. Um, you know, Venezuela is, you know, is, is for those of um, that might not know, Venezuela has been under a regime um, for many decades. And I actually left um, Venezuela right after I graduated from college and I had done an internship with United Nations Children's Fund. And my plan was actually to come and learn English. And then, you know, with English, having been in the United States, I would go back to my country and every door would be open, right? Um, as I was here, um, actually my dad became quite worried about the situation in Venezuela. And this we're talking, I'm gonna date myself, um, 1999. Um, and so I, I ended up staying and, and I pursue um, master in business administration. What I have seen over the years is something that um, um, I have seen how communities have been, um, been um, further apart, brought further apart, and, and not even physically, most importantly, um, uh, in terms of values. And, and I see that in this country. I see that um, it's, 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 it's sad to see how philosophies or, or, or values actually tear you apart as a community. And that is, that is a crime, that is a crime that we do to each other. We can be much stronger together, having differences, because we're going to have difference of opinions. If we don't do that, well, how boring our life could be. But can we actually um, actually have civil conversations? Can we be have inquiry? Can we seek to learn from each other? And in that, you know, my mom and my aunt didn't talk to each other for decades. And I just learned that my, my aunt is actually losing a little bit of her mind. Was it worth it? that my, dad, my mom didn't speak for decades. I mean, what can we learn? How can we stretch a hand to each other to learn more about why are you coming from there? What, what, is that your, what, what does that make you think about that? Um, and, and it's hard, right? Because I have plenty of friends or, or some of them are not my friends anymore. And I'm like, I need to shut you down. You're too negative or whatever it is. But does it really matter? Because that person is not gonna change his or her mind, and it's worth the damage, um, the fact that we're not actually talking to each other. That's amazing and, and really good words of advice. Was it, was it hard watching what was going on there from afar? And how did you sort of deal with that? Well, it was so hard, right? Because I, I, I felt almost guilty, right? That I was sitting in such privileged part when um, we, you know, I, I were five, I'm the youngest of five, and my oldest brother is actually six in his late 60s, and to see that little by little, my family was leaving Venezuela, my, my younger, uh, my, my nieces and nephews, right, particularly because the future um, wasn't as good for them, and, and they went on to find new opportunities, like any immigrant does, and I think we forget that it's not easy to leave your country you leave your country but your heart never leaves your country and to make that decision is not an easy decision to make for for anybody and to see our family who we used to get together every sunday to have a meal together um to see that little by little we were all you know going somewhere else at this point you know now only my brother is left in venezuela probably he would go back in two years and um and and um and then, you know, my mom is actually now alone, uh, basically, and we have to figure out what we're going to do. She doesn't want to leave. My dad was an immigrant to Venezuela, and, and actually he said, I'm never going to leave this country. And, and that is the powerful of an immigrant, right? The power of an immigrant that 
love their adopted country so much and is willing to give so much for that country. Um, so it was incredibly hard, but you know what it was harder, Kristen? It was actually seeing some of the patterns repeat here in the United States. Polarization, how um, egos, how um, you know, actually patterns of wealth were, um, are breaking this country apart. Uh, almost to realize the American dream is very pretty on, in the movies, but it's not real for many, many people. Um, and, and that was actually harder because it was actually like I was watching the movie twice uh, with different actors. And that was what is, is heart wrenching and almost like, um, it's like, oh, what can I do to make it better? Because I saw it happen there. What is that we cannot learn from history? What is that we have like such short time memory? And, and that, that is actually what is the hardest. Um, and um, streams are not good in any of the, um, the, the sites. That's, that's what I say without getting too political. Well, thank you for sharing that. Um, so you said in your story that you moved to the US um, to get, um, I think you came here for school. Um, did you, so was it that your dad wanted you to go because he was concerned or did you have plans to come to the U.S. before that? Yeah, no, I have plans to come. I actually came to learn English and my plan was not to study here, but things were starting to get um, a little bit, um, you know, my dad was worried about what he was seeing in Venezuela. He had also, uh, my dad had lived through the Second World War. So in a way he was seeing the same patterns that um, we were seeing there, right? And so said, you're already there, you know, you do an MBA, you hopefully, you know, not an MBA, but at that point actually what's interesting is I, I wanted to do a master in public policy in public administration because my experience at UNICEF had been so wonderful. It had been such an opportunity to actually understand how um, um, mission-driven organizations work. And so I, um, I was actually going to do, um, I really was looking to do a, a, master in, a master in public administration and really focus on nonprofits, which I ended up doing. Um, and at that time, my dad said, um, you know, what people need more in the, in, in the nonprofit business is actually a business thinking. And it would open more doors to me. And since I'm helping you pay for it, you're going to do an MBA. And there we go, I did an MBA. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, you know, I'm sure that it completely benefited your path. Yeah, it did. Um, so tell me what you think, because you've studied in both places. What were the differences? You know, I have to say um, education, and, and I have to say this. So I, my um, K-12 experience is in private, which this is, again, the sad part in Venezuela is that, you know, people would, um, you know, very rarely people would do public education. Um, people might do parochial schools and might, you know, really have several jobs to be able to afford parochial schools. Um, and that's what breaks countries, right? That, that's what I, um, in DPS, because I do know that K-12 is, is, is so important, so important that our kids graduate ready to lead a successful life, whether that is deciding to pursue a college career, whether that is to become the best entrepreneur. I hate, and I tell this to my kids all the time, um, I don't want our children, and I said our kids because I think every child in Denver should be our kid, and, and we should be worried about them like if they was, um, he or she was our kid. And um, I, I said, I, I we would fail as adults and we are failing constantly uh, when we, when our kids have to make decisions, not based in their choices and opportunities, but based in the fact that we didn't prepare them well to make those decisions. Um, I, I would say, um, you know, and, and that's what I would say about Venezuela, right? You have very, very good education um, that comes out of private institutions. Actually, public university in Venezuela is, is very good, very, um, very deep learning and, and a lot of critical thinking development, a lot of world world uh, world world view, <laughs> and um, and and I think at the same time here in the United States also of course you have the ability to um, more more focus more more around technology more innovation. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, education is certainly the great equalizer. And I think that access for everyone is so important and you're doing such incredible work on that. Um, so moving on from, from graduating, um, I love your story of working at a convenience store to meet people and build community. Can you talk a little bit about yeah. that? I, you know, I love this too, because I think it's so important. I worked in, um, I waited tables and working in the service industry is such a great like learning experience. Can I talk about that? Yeah. So I, um, so I had lived in Atlanta. I was actually working for Turner Broadcasting System, Latin America, and I um, got married and moved to Baltimore and I did not know anybody other than my husband. And Baltimore was a very closed down town. Um, and I needed money. My husband was a fellow at the time. Uh, and I was not finding a job. I would send resumes and resumes and nothing, not even the out of office reply. So, um, you know, I, I needed money. And so I started working. I would go to this Italian, uh, if you're ever in the Baltimore area, go to the Pasquales. It's a wonderful Italian market. And so I went and I said, I need a job. Would you hire me as a cashier? Uh, and they, they did. Um, and I, it was a wonderful experience for many reasons. First of all, because um, you know, I was becoming, um, I was very self-isolated, right? I had moved to a new town. My husband was a fellow. He was working hours and hours and hours. My family was uh, far away. So I, I was depressed. I was home alone, right? Um, I, um, and it is also because, you know, I got, I get, I, I spoke with people. I, I remember, um, you know, using the broom to clean the floors and, and people will come and start conversation. We created a new system to organize the, uh, the cashier because they were, you know, they had, it had been like that forever. And, and ultimately, you know, you, you got to know people and also experience how rude people can be, right? And how you actually don't want to show up. So um, it was really a wonderful experience. Actually, I, I kept working. I ended up having a job, getting a job. And um, I actually kept working on Saturdays because I enjoyed it so much. And is, that's the power of retail, right? Is, 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 um, when I think about all the movement into um, online and, um, and, and uh, online shopping, I think what we're also losing um, is, is, the, is the connection with community. And that's the power of small businesses, right? Is, is really bringing um, people together. Um, I, I finally ended up um, finding a job because I made cookies and I went to this party who I actually ended up meeting this person at the, at the, um, at the Pascuales and she invited me to her house. I, brought, I made these cookies and someone was saying, oh, we need someone to that would know international marketing. And I was like, oh, I, I know that. And so I started working with um, an organization that was doing healthcare management uh, for affluent individuals in a way, very beginning of, of um, world. Uh, it was a startup company, learned tons. Um, it was my actually my first time working in the United States. Um, I say my, my first very Anglo job in the United States because before I was in Turner Broadcasting System, I was like working for the United Nations. Everybody was from somewhere else. We used to have, we would used to sit at lunchtime and everybody was uh, bringing their food that they've made or they, and, and everybody was sharing off of the plates. So my first day at this job at, at Pinnacle Care, I said, I see there and I'm like, you know, I always brought a little bit more to share and I would start like offering people and people were like, we were like three people. I mean, we, we, just, we were very few and people were like, what are you doing? We don't know what to do with this. <laughs> so That must have been like a really interesting time in your life though. Cause when I think about like who you are and how talented you are and what you bring to the workplace and your knowledge of both cultures, what did that feel like not being able to find a role and how did yeah. you get through that? Thank you um, for asking that. You know, I, it was very interesting because of course I, um, you know, I came from being home, right? I mean, that was Turner and, and it was really, a, 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 um, I felt so home, right? And then I literally moved miles away, um, new, you know, newly married. I didn't have any family or, or friends. And I go into this, you know, this, this company that was founded by four white male 
Um, but I really didn't mean, mean you know, I wasn't thinking about it too much. No, let's be honest, nobody was talking about DEI work at that point, right? You're rare. Um, and um, I, um, there were so many defining moments for me. I remember one day, actually, my, my um, CEO uh, um, had a brain tumor. And um, he, um, I ended up, I, I did, I created all the membership material. So I knew the membership very well, back and forth. But I, I had not done sales other than when I was, you know, very, actually, my first business was selling swimming suits. Um, but other than that, I had not sold anything. Um, and, um, but he said, can you drive me to this meeting? And, and I said, of course, I'll, I'll, I'll go and I'll drive you. And when we get there, he says, I'm not feeling well, can you actually make the pitch? And I was like, oh, okay, sure, I'll do it. Um, and what I was going to do, I mean, we were already like, there. I was going to say, no, no, I'm just your chauffeur. Um, so I did it. Um, we leave the meeting. And um, you know the meeting transpired. Whatever we sat uh, for lunch, which now I don't even understand how quickly he would have gotten that feedback. But I I I, I blame it to the brain tumor. Um, and um, he sat me down and said, you know, Veronica, we almost lost that client because of your accent. And um, see, I, I still get teary. And I was like, what? I mean, I, I mean, like to make someone fail because of me. I mean, I felt terrible. So I, you know, I got home that state. I was like, David, I really need to practice, right? And, and David was like, Veronica, I don't think that was, David is my husband. I don't think that was a fair assessment, but you know, right? So I started practicing in front of the mirror every night, the words that were hard for me, medical evacuation, medical evacuation, right? And over time, I, you know, I guess, um, you know, I, I did better. I, I said, I'm gonna actually use my um, international experience and even my accent to relate to people. So we were work with a lot of people in New York. So I would call and of course, I, this is people who had traveled and had seen the world. So we would develop relationships based on that. And um, so anyway, so I'm having my review and um, they said, um, <laughs> part of my review was like, you're doing so well. If you were in Venezuela, you will be the CEO of this company. So I got so excited. I got home and I tell this to my husband. And he's like, uh, what do you mean if you were in Venezuela? Why wouldn't you do that in here in the United States? So those were, I mean, those are things that punch you along the way, right? And and things that you're like, oh yeah. I mean, I'm I'm from somewhere else, right? Would I be able to? really be for from here right so um you know me and my acts and the fact that i was an immigrant the, i mean all these things cheap away your confidence mm -hmm. even in ways that uh, might not be very re might, might not you know let no, might not be very evident but they chip away who you are um in, in as you build your identity but i love that you know, your approach for dealing with that feedback was incredible. And I think oftentimes as women, we, we have to deal with a lot of that. Um, you know, like I've had, you know, men say, you can't, you know, come at people like this. You have to ask questions, right? And you could look at that two ways, right? I could say, well, why should I have to change my approach because I'm a woman or I'm going to work on it and change my approach and get what I want. I'm going to be from Venezuela. I'm going to have a different culture and I'm going to be a CEO and you are. So <laughs> like, it, it's amazing. And your path has brought you there. You, um, you talk a lot about David and you guys have a really cool story. Um, talk about how you guys met and how you oh. got married because I love this story. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I actually, I am talking about David. He should, someone should tell him that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, I, I think we, we, part of it is like, we don't think about the partnership we have, right? And, and, and uh, David is a partner, that's, that's what he is in my life. Um, so we met in Venezuela, way, year, way 
years before I was even thinking about coming. Um, he went to my cousin's wedding in a little town in, in that is called Coro, um, like even four hours uh, driving from Caracas. So he went to the wedding and we liked each other. It was a wedding and everybody was, liked each other at weddings. Because here the gringos were coming and the Latinas were there. It was, you know, a whole thing. Um, uh, my, my boyfriend at the time, Diego, so you know, she's just news and news. Um, and so I met him, we liked each other, uh, but I mean, it was a wedding. We, um, we started writing letters because internet wasn't very good in Venezuela. So, but it, it, would, it would take forever, like months, right? And at some point we lost contact. When I came back to learn English, um, actually my cousin who I was living with her, um, we were, um, her husband was on call. It was like midnight, we were having coffee. We used to do that a lot. And if you, if you are a friend of mine, you know that you will come home and I would offer you always coffee. And if you're not to come over. Um, so um, I, um, we actually um, were talking and she said, you should call David. He always asks for you. And I said, oh, fine, uh, let's call him. We'll call him tomorrow. She was like, no, let's call him now. And so we call him, it was midnight. Um, and uh, we actually um, reconnected. Um, it was the night that he was doing his oncology, um, pediatric oncology resident. He says, somehow it was really the worst night of my pediatric residency. And then you show up out of nowhere. We used the, we used the calling the beepers to call him because we didn't have a cell phone or anything. So um, we, uh, we started dating, but he was in Baltimore, I was in Atlanta, I wasn't thinking I was going to stay in the United States, so, and, you know, he is Jewish, I was, I don't know what I am right now, but I was Catholic, I grew up Catholic, and I thought his mom was going to poison me, I thought my mom, my dad and my mom were just going to bring me away, um, and, uh, but it so happened that we made it happen, and, and we've been happily married sometimes more happy than other times, uh, um, and have two wonderful boys, John 16 and Mateo 13. And he sounds so incredibly supportive of you. And I think that that's so important, right, to have that support, especially on your journey. Um, what, tell, tell me about the lessons that you learned early on in that first job and in the working world. Yeah. Well, I think, I think part of, you know, identity, right? I think it was so confusing for me to realize who I was, you know, at that time, you know, we would talk about um, acculturation, integration. I don't even know what is the right one anymore, um, right? That was at the very beginning as, a, as an immigrant, you should have uh, integrated, acculturated, uh, I can't even remember. So like I said, over time, some of that feedback started shipping away um, who um, there were times where I really, I mean, who I am, what I am, I, yeah, I'm, people, I'm, I'm very, you know, I can fit in this box, right, I can be the person who, oh, I really have a good friend that is an, an immigrant, so I can be that person if, if someone needed that, right, and so um, even there were times where I didn't feel comfortable speaking English, I'm, I'm sorry, speaking Spanish, English was my second language, um, and um, I, I think you're talking about something that we talked about when I actually, um, um, I was, I had one boss that one day told me, um, you know, people, um, you're, um, oh, also during that time when I was doing my MBA, someone said, oh, you're probably very smart, but I can't understand a thing of what you say, right? I mean, so all of those things like start again, uh, that shipping away. So I would say there were times where, I mean, my self-confidence, even to this day, I, I have, I, I imposter syndrome is, is really real. I'm really trying to get away from that because I think the more we say, the more we um, sort of start creating a culture around it. So um, I think we had to stop say, believing, not, I would say not realizing that it's true, but not putting it so much in our heads. And it's so hard because I tell you, even when I, you saw when I, I, I go and give the speech to the gala, a thousand people, the first thing this, as I'm taking the step into the stage, those words come back. You're at, I mean, it's so like so ingrained some, somewhere here. So it's so important that when we give feedback, because there, there, there might have been some truth to that feedback. But um, really, when do we, how do we give that feedback? How do we, I mean, that is the responsibility of a leader, of, a, of, a, of someone who actually cares about someone you work with is, is to make sure that your feedback is actually not destroying someone's confidence. So um, 
in that too, right, I moved to Denver. Um, I'm also not a Latina that lived here all her life, right? So again, I, where do I fit in, right? So I'm in a meeting and some, you know, another one of my bosses comes to me and says, you know, Branca, you have to be very careful because, you know, I received this feedback that when you speak, the first thing that people are gonna think about um, is that you're gonna say something about the Latino community. And I'm like, okay, fine, good. I mean, now that I look back, of course it actually helped me um, not only speak about the Latino community, but understand other communities of color and, 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 and ultimately, I mean, the community that I experience the most is the Latino community, right? And not every, you know, not every member of this, but anyway, so then I have that job and then I moved to, to DPS, Denver Public Schools. And Tom Ball's work um, tells me, Franca, why is that you don't, don't speak Spanish? I hire you to connect to the community. I hire you to be able to speak with our parents that have nobody to speak with. And I'm like, okay, here I'm very confused because all people tell me to speak in Right. But um, I do have to say that people might say a lot of things about Tom Bosberg, but he probably was among my bosses, the one that helped me gain the greatest confidence of who I was. And it took a huge leap of faith because he hired me to be the chief family and community engagement officer, engagement officer of DPS with a team of 70 something people. And I have not hired that. Uh, but all, not only he hired me, but he supported me um, with, um, with training. He sent me to Harvard. He put me, you know, he, he not only said, I'm going to hire you, but I'm going to nurture you and retain you and help you in your path. So, I mean, it wasn't, believe me, we had a lot of arguments, but um, he, um, he was that, so. You know, it's so crazy as you're, as you're talking and thinking about your journey and you know the torch that you carry for so many that follow you, right? I can't imagine what you had to deal with um, along your journey and you still were able to find success amidst not being able to be any of, of yourself, right? Like having to stuff that down in so many situations. How did you get to the point that you are today where now it's embraced because I can't imagine, again, someone looking at you and especially leading the organization that you're leading, your experience is perfectly aligned to help you lead it and do what you do. How did you find your way there? Well, I can say now that I'm, I'm unapologetic, uh, oh, I can't even pronounce it, but I have no apologies in being a Latina and it took a long time. Um, but you know what, what it was? It was the Cafecito group. It was people like Rosemary Rodriguez. It was people like Michelle Lucero. It was the fly ladies where we lift each other up all the time. It, it was also, and it's probably, um, you know, it was um, maturity, right? Um, but um, I, I think we can, um, I, I probably stage too, right? Um, but it was a point where, and I do think is, is society changing, right? It's, it's finding people along the way that says you can be who you are, you can show up who you are and show up self and authentic. Um, and um, I think we create layers and we put, put masks um, that, um, that show what we want other people to want us to be. And, but it's not easy, right? Because you're being judged by, you could be judged by a boss. You could be judged by someone who um, with your, even your employee. I mean, there were times, um, I do have to say, um, family and community engagement in DPS, that team was so powerful. I mean, that team, because it was a very diverse team, a team where we could all show up who we are. So even transitioning to the DPS foundation team, which was primarily uh, why women was really hard, because I didn't know how to fit in into that, right? How would I show in a way that I would honestly don't scare them away. I mean, that is the reality, right? Um, so, um, but over time, right, I think um, it, it comes with, and there are many of them are in this meeting too, is, is they were the rock that I needed at many times. I mean, Ashley was one of the first people I called when my dad passed, right? So um, we work with people, we live with people. And if you're in a job where you're um, not happy or you cannot show up yourself, and I'm not saying go offend people, 
But when, if you're in a job where you cannot show up yourself, leave because that job is limiting you. So agreed. You know, in a transition into a time in your life that was really difficult. And I think hearing about the reason that we ask these questions and thank you for being willing to share about it is because when we talk about perseverance, especially as women, the strength that comes from that. I mean, every, your story that you've shared with us so far is all about perseverance, right? To get to where you are. I want to transition to talking about family. Um, and I know particularly your, your father, he was instrumental in your life. I had lost my father, you know, right around the same time that you lost yours. And of course I just lost my mother. So I'd love for you, if you're willing to kind of talk about the passing of your dad and, and dealing with grief and, and loss and how you got through it. Yeah. So my dad was my true North. Uh, he, um, you saw, I mean, he literally was, he sat me at a table and I think I was 10, 12 years old. I cannot remember and said, one day you will lead a table like this. So he put a big vision out there. Right. And, um, he was, a, he worked very, um, he worked all the time. And I, I think I have maybe the electro, was it the complex I think it's Electra, the one that is in love with like that. I probably have that. I call him Papito Lindo. So um, he was my advisor. He, we would have very um, um, intellectual conversations. And um, I actually went, um, I went back to Venezuela after his passing. I found a folder of all the um, articles, like when people, when it was announced that I was the CEO of the foundation, I would, um, when I would go to conferences, he loved seeing his name written. And there is a story of why I'm Veronica Figo de Fleischer, but a lot of people know me by Veronica Figo. It was part of the identity. One day my dad says, you know, Veronica, you move to the United States, you leave us all behind a little bit dramatic, but you know, that's all we, I mean, he's Italian, right? Italian leaving in Venezuela. So, um, and he says, you know, you, you, and then all of a sudden you're Veronica Fleischer. Who is Veronica Fleischer? And you know what he made me think? Who is Veronica Fleischer? And I said, yeah, you're right. And actually when I moved to uh, DPS, I um, used the Figoli because I realized that who, that's who I was. I, um, and I, I, you know, I, I respect my husband, family is amazing. I mean, I, they have accomplished so much, but I'm not a flesh. I mean, I, I'm not only a flesh, I'm a Figoli, right? So, um, and it was also because he loved seeing his name on things. Um, so I, I found this folder with uh, name tags and things that he has kept over the years of myself, right? In my career, even emails that I have sent of, of questions, right, that I had. So my dad passes away, and in, in a way, um, the hard part is, and he lived a beautiful life. He lived to 91, and, and when people tell you, um, you know, uh, oh, he lived a great life, I didn't care much about that, right? What I care about is that I wasn't going to have another year with him. I wasn't going to have another two to three years with him, that I could not touch him, that I could not feel him. So, um, so it was really hard. I, I didn't think, I think there was a lot of closures, right? Because a lot of it is I couldn't be, I couldn't spend as much time in Venezuela as I wanted to before his passing. So it was really hard. It hit me. Griff hit me like I never thought it could hit me. Um, so, you know, um, to grief, I say, it's a process. Live it. Um, I told you, Kristen, um, I used to scream in the car by myself because I would go to work and pretend that nothing was happening. Although I couldn't, sometimes I couldn't resist it that much. And I would remember my first board meeting after my dad passed and I, I had a little bit of a breakdown and there was an amazing board of directors. I think Priya is here, Nancy's here that we're okay with that. And, and I think that um, um, we have to get better at um, again, showing up authentically. And in creating environments where we can do that, right? Because that 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 comes down to numbers. Mm -hmm. I think productivity is impacted because of mental health. How much dollars are we actually investing in mental health to support our employees, right? So, um, and um, so it was really hard. Um, it was a process. Um, I probably couldn't even speak. I mean, it's been almost four years, and I couldn't speak about it. Um, I tell you, Kristen, and I tell everybody here, grief is a process and we can grieve many things, right? We can grieve the loss of a partner. We can grieve, we're all in a way in trauma, 
right? We, we experienced a year that we thought we'd never had. I'm sure a lot of in this call have more privileges than others, right? We think about the communities that um, um, everybody has lost something and, and it is important to give the due process to, to grieving. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna pivot. We'll do just one more question because I wanna open it up to others because I know there's gonna be questions for you. You know, you're also a bit of someone that I follow because you're there are certain causes um, that matter to you. You're a bit of an activist, but a very like gentle, knowledgeable one, the way that you teach about the things that you're passionate about. You took a trip or organized a trip um, with Stephanie Donner to El Paso. I want you to talk a little bit about how you do that because I've never experienced anything quite like the knowledge that I gained from your activism and the way. Oh, well, first of all, I, I don't like to call myself an activist. <laughs> um, what would you call it? I, I, well, you know what? I, I actually think that um, I, 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 what I really wanted to be when I was growing up was actually a diplomat. Um, and I, um, um, I, I, I think diplomacy um, is, is I, I think we can, uh, and, and don't, I have nothing against activists, let me make sure. I just, it's not my style. I, I feel that um, we can shut down people very much if we're not trying to see where are they coming from. Right. And for me, it's better para creer, right? See to believe. And part of that was the genesis of one night um, Stephanie, who's on the call, uh, we were talking about, we were at her house watching actually one of the State of the Unions where um, our former president was talking about immigration. And we knew that was being, I was like, Stephanie El Paso, one of the most dangerous cities in America. I was there and I didn't feel like I was in any danger, right? And, and we put this out, these statements and media puts out these statements and in this words become power, right? Words become worship. So I said, you know, we said, we were talking, I said, why don't we bring people? And we were really talking about five women, right? We were just, you know, get there. We would stay at Stephanie's house. And all of a sudden started like, it was 10 and it was 15 and it ended up being 30, which we actually had to shut it down because we didn't have enough bus buses to put people in. So it was about a group of 30 something women. Um, uh, to um, actually see it mm -hmm. and hear it from the people and hear from the perspective. We were in two, I, the, the one of the officers on the buses on the bus that took us literally to the, to the, um, to the border was the, the perspective, the, the, how he presented the story was so different than how the other one presented the story. The interesting part, and this is applicable for many careers is, the, the, the one that presented the story with more empathy had born, had, was born in El Paso, had grown in the community, uh, had family in Juarez, had family, right? And you could see how his approach to, um, I mean, he was an officer, right? He was the law, but his approach was more empathic because again, his lived experiences. Well, and it's phenomenal. And what I loved about it, it was just hands-on learning. And I want to call myself a diplomat too. I love that. I love that word. We're all going to adopt that. Okay. Um, I think with that, we'll, we'll turn it over to questions from the audience and I'll see if anything comes up too for me or, or if Veronica, you want to share anything as well. So Heather, I'll move it to you because you can see everyone. Great. I don't see anything yet, but you can put it in the chat. You can do the raise your hand. While you're looking at that, I have one more question on my on my list that I just thought of, Veronica. Talk about, you mentioned briefly some different communities of, of women that support you. And you talked about one that you went to when you when you lost your father. How has that helped you in your path? Oh my God. You know, I think, um, you know, I think that um, there's research around this, right? Women need other women. Um, and, and actually there's a research that says that's why women live longer than men is because we need a stronger um, quadrant, right? We need more community. And um, I, um, I really, um, through the passing of my father, right? Um, my family was away. I couldn't go back and forth a lot. I, I don't have any other family. I have a cousin here, but 
Um, but it was the friends that would make that phone call, that would talk, that sometimes I simply didn't want to talk about anything that had to do with, with my dad, or I, had, I wanted to talk tons about him and, and take it to a point where I couldn't talk anymore because I was so, I was sobbing, right? But again, that's part of that physical grief that needs to happen. Um, I, I wanted to say, I probably haven't spoken a lot about my mom, and I wanted to give an opportunity for that because that has been part of also the maturity and the development. Um, I feel in a way that um, my, my, the relationship with my mom is, is an interesting one because um, I, I, I had such a strong relationship with my father that in a way, I think the relationship with my mom hurt a little bit because of that, right? Uh, I was totally uh, at that if you haven't figured it out by now, right? Um, but um, I, um, you know, my, but part of it was too, because my mom never um, worked outside of the home. She worked at home. And um, when I was early on in my career and I had my children were young, she said to me once, um, you are selfish because you could organize your life differently to dedicate to your children. And I took that to, we fought tremendously, right? Because I, I was already feeling very guilty and I didn't need my mom to tell me that um, I, um, I was selfish. I mean, she literally said, use the word selfish. But as years went by, I understood there was some wisdom in those words. And the wisdom was that she saw that I was so, um, spending so much time in my work that was I was in a way abandoning my children. I was not finding that balance. And I don't believe in balance, but I, 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 I wasn't like, I wasn't spending that carve out time for my children too. And also what I understood later on is that it might have been even her own frustrations. My mom could have been an amazing, I actually, a lot of my traits, not that I'm amazing, but um, a lot of my traits are actually similar to my mom and they come from the building community part. Um, and um, I, I mean, she grew up, she married at 16, never worked, never graduated from, from college, right? So she was, again, uh, in a way, um, showing her identity, right? Talking from her point of view, right? All that she knew was that she was a manager of the house, right? And, and she saw me steering away from that. And, and maybe we could have talked about it more and unpack what she was trying to say, right? But um, I think now, now that my dad has passed and she's actually coming up, we have been able to, I mean, I'm, I'm strong-willed and she is, so we fight a lot, um, but um, we have found, um, we're finding each other again. Your ability to take comments and feedback that would otherwise be hurtful and to empathize with that and take a deep look at yourself is truly admirable. I oh no, girl. Hmm. I'm serious. Like it's no, no, yeah, but do, I take them. I <laughs> overthink it. So I've been mean, like <laughs> very pretty. I think, so. I think it's really um, quite admirable. When I'm dealing with some feedback that stings, I'm going to call you. <laughs> so we have a question from Tess. Tess, do you want to just ask it? Yeah, sure. And I'm driving. I had my video on and then I just saw there was a police officer driving right next oh, to me. Oh, well, like, don't get pulled over. Not do that. Yeah. <laughs> so I apologize for that. Um, but so, Veronica, number one, just thank you for your tremendous and beautiful vulnerability and sharing. And I also have a death of a parent. Um, and yeah, just really appreciate hearing your story and, and as an immigrant coming to this country so so thank you for all of that and i actually am very new to working at dps um Denver public schools for the college and career success team so my question is i'm just I, i'm so curious and almost in awe of the work that y'all do to support dps and, and i'm super curious to hear some insights on in all the tremendous need and all the kind of interdependent Huge, tremendous challenges, right, that are facing our families, exasperated by, by COVID. But um, how do you and your team kind of identify and prioritize what are those biggest needs and then be able to support them accordingly? Oh, well, that's a whole new session. 
But no, thank you and welcome to Team DPS. I, I tell people, you know, DPS as an organization has a lot of flaws. I mean, terrible. I mean, if you think about public education was, was um, I always say people say public education is not doing what they need to do. It is because it was actually founded in, in being, uh, or in being, you know, as we know, public education was founded in actually the differences and keeping the students not for learning. I mean, it's, it's a system that, um, um, it was designed in a way to fail um, our most vulnerable students, right? So this is in, in a way it needs to be dismantled, but that's my opinion, uh, differently. But um, anyway, so I we work with the district very closely to find out areas. I always talk about a Venn diagram, what funders want to give money to, what the money, dis, uh, what the money, the, the district needs money for, and, and sort of that inter intersectionality of what we can do, how can we leverage the most? I mean, the DPS is an organization that is worth $1.2 billion. So in any given year, what an organization like Denver Public Schools Foundation that we can fundraise between eight to $12 million can really do. And, and a lot of that is the flexibilities that come with an ability to try things that are not completely tied into general funding. Career and college success is a great idea. It's a, it's a great, um, um, example of that because it's not only about the financial resources but it's actually bringing community together around that right it's, it's bringing in industry to say you know we actually need kids to graduate from this we need kids as we women learn firsthand son experience in el paso our students cannot dream of something they've never seen so when they go to this industry when they see themselves or learn that someone can actually be a, um, you know, can have a successful career starting from the ramp at United to becoming the, the, the chief airport operator officer, those things, those dreams become palpable. Um, so um, longer story that we could go on and on and on, but um, is basically what philanthropy can leverage out of the general funds. That's amazing. Well, with that, I think we're at time. Um, is there anything else you want to add, Veronica? Do we miss anything? No, no, I think thank you. Thank you for putting up for with all my talking. And <laughs> and and I would start like um, the woman from uh, bank. We, we just got to be gentle, more gentle to each other. Uh, I always think about what would what would have happened to one of those tutors if they would he or she would have likely he the majority made eye contact with someone. Let's try to make eye contact with each other. That's easy to do. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing your story. Love you. Thank you. Love you back.